Welcome and thank you for stopping by Sheila's Audiobooks and I am Sheila. This recording is coming from South Texas. All stories on this recording are in the public domain for United States copyright law. This story is about Tommy and Puppins, two young people short of money and restless for excitement, embark on a daring business scheme, Young Adventurers Limited. Their advertisement says they are willing to do anything, go anywhere. But their first assignment plunges them into more danger than they ever imagined. Part 3 There's that, said Tuppence suddenly pointing to a small, old-fashioned safe let into the wall. It's for jewellery, I believe, but there might be something else in it. The key was in the lock, and Julia swung open the door, and searched inside. He was some time over the task. Well, said Tuppence impatiently. There was a pause before Julius answered, then he withdrew his head and shut to the door. Nothing, he said. In five minutes a brisk young doctor arrived, hastily summoned. He was deferential to Sir James, whom he recognized. Heart failure, or possibly an overdose of some sleeping draught. He sniffed. Rather an odor of chloral in the air. Tuppence remembered the glass she had upset. A new thought drove her to the washstand. She found the little bottle from which Mrs. Vondermeyer had poured a few drops. It had been three parts full. Now, it was empty. Chapter 14 A Consultation Nothing was more surprising and bewildering to Tuppence than the ease and simplicity with which everything was arranged, owing to Sir James's skillful handling. The doctor accepted quite readily the theory that Mrs. von der Meyer had accidentally taken an overdose of chloral. He doubted whether an inquest would be necessary. If so, he would let Sir James know. He understood that Mrs. von der Meyer was on the eve of departure for abroad, and that the servants had already left. Sir James and his young friends had been paying a call upon her when she was suddenly stricken down and they had spent the night in the flat, not liking to leave her alone. Did they know of any relatives? They did not, but Sir James referred him to Mrs. Vondermeyer's solicitor. Shortly afterwards a nurse arrived to take charge, and the other left the elopement building. And what now? asked Julius, with a gesture of despair. I guess we're down and out for good. Sir James stroked his chin thoughtfully. No, he said quietly. There is still the chance that Dr. Hall may be able to tell us something. Gee, I'd forgotten him. The chance is slight, but it must not be neglected. I think I told you that he is staying at the Metropole. I should suggest that we call upon him there as soon as possible. Shall we say after a bath and breakfast? It was arranged that Tuppence and Julius should return to the Ritz, and call for Sir James in the car. This program was faithfully carried out and a little after eleven they drew up before the Metropole. They asked for Dr. Hall, and a page boy went in search of him. In a few minutes the little doctor came hurrying towards them. Can you spare us a few minutes, Dr. Hall? said Sir James pleasantly. Let me introduce you to Miss Cowley. Mr. Hersheimer, I think, you already know. A quizzical gleam came into the doctor's eye as he shook hands with Julius. Ah, yes, my young friend of the tree episode. Ankle all right, eh? I guess it's cured owing to your skillful treatment, Doc. And the heart trouble? Ha ha. Still searching, said Julius briefly. To come to the point, can we have a word with you in private? Asked Sir James. Certainly. I think there is a room here where we shall be quite undisturbed. He led the way, and the others followed him. They sat down, and the doctor looked inquiringly at Sir James. Dr. Hall. I am very anxious to find a certain young lady for the purpose of obtaining a statement from her. I have reason to believe that she has been at one time or another in your establishment at Bournemouth. I hope I am transgressing no professional etiquette in questioning you on the subject. I suppose it is a matter of testimony? Sir James hesitated a moment, then he replied. Yes. I shall be pleased to give you any information in my power. What is the young lady's name? Mr. Hersheimer asked me, I remember, he half turned to Julius. The name, said Sir James bluntly, is really immaterial. She would be almost certainly sent to you under an assumed one. 
But I should like to know if you are acquainted with a Mrs. Vondermeyer? Mrs. Vondermeyer, of 20 South Audley Mansions? I know her slightly. You are not aware of what has happened? What do you mean? You do not know that Mrs. Vondermeyer is dead? Dear, dear, I had no idea of it. When did it happen? She took an overdose of chloral last night. Purposely? Accidentally, it is believed. I should not like to say myself. Anyway, she was found dead this morning. Very sad. A singularly handsome woman. I presumed she was a friend of yours, since you are acquainted with all these details. I am acquainted with the details because, well, it was I who found her dead. Indeed, said the doctor, starting. Yes, said Sir James, and stroked his chin reflectively. This is very sad news, but you will excuse me if I say that I do not see how it bears on the subject of your inquiry. It bears on it in this way, is it not a fact that Mrs. Vondermeyer committed a young relative of hers to your charge? Julius leaned forward eagerly. That is the case, said the doctor quietly. Under the name of? Janet Vondermeyer. I understood her to be a niece of Mrs. Vondermeyer's. And she came to you? As far as I can remember in June or July of 1915. Was she a mental case? She is perfectly sane, if that is what you mean. I understood from Mrs. Vondermeyer that the girl had been with her on the Lusitania when that ill-fated ship was sunk, and had suffered a severe shock in consequence. We're on the right track, I think? Sir James looked round. As I said before, I'm a mutt. Returned Julius. The doctor looked at them all curiously. You spoke of wanting a statement from her, he said. Supposing she is not able to give one? What? You have just said that she is perfectly sane. So she is. Nevertheless, if you want a statement from her concerning any events prior to May 7, 1915, she will not be able to give it to you. They looked at the little man, stupefied. He nodded cheerfully. It's a pity, he said. A great pity, especially as I gather, Sir James, that the matter is important. But there it is, she can tell you nothing. But why, man? Darn it all, why? The little man shifted his benevolent glance to the excited young American. Because Janet Vondermeyer is suffering from a complete loss of memory. What? Quite so. An interesting case, a very interesting case. Not so uncommon, really, as you would think. There are several very well-known parallels. It's the first case of the kind that I've had under my own personal observation, and I must admit that I've found it of absorbing interest. There was something rather ghoulish in the little man's satisfaction. And she remembers nothing, said Sir James slowly. Nothing prior to May 7, 1915. After that date her memory is as good as yours or mine. Then the first thing she remembers? Is landing with the survivors. Everything before that is a blank. She did not know her own name, or where she had come from, or where she was. She couldn't even speak her own tongue. But surely all this is most unusual? Put in Julius. No, my dear sir. Quite normal under the circumstances. Severe shock to the nervous system. Loss of memory proceeds nearly always on the same lines. I suggested a specialist, of course. There's a very good man in Paris, makes a study of these cases, but Mrs. Vondermeyer opposed the idea of publicity that might result from such a course. I can imagine she would, said Sir James grimly. I fell in with her views. There is a certain notoriety given to these cases. And the girl was very young, nineteen, I believe. It seemed a pity that her infirmity should be talked about, might damage her prospects. Besides, there is no special treatment to pursue in such cases. It is really a matter of waiting. Waiting? Yes, sooner or later, the memory will return, as suddenly as it went. But in all probability the girl will have entirely forgotten the intervening period, and will take up life where she left off, at the sinking of the Lusitania. And when do you expect this to happen? The doctor shrugged his shoulders. Ah, that I cannot say. Sometimes it is a matter of months, sometimes it has been known to be as long as twenty years. Sometimes another shock does the trick. One restores what the other took away. Another shock, eh? said Julius thoughtfully. Exactly. There was a case in Colorado, the little man's voice trailed on, voluble, mildly enthusiastic. Julius did not seem to be listening. He had relapsed into his own thoughts and was frowning. 
Suddenly he came out of his brown study, and hit the table such a resounding bang with his fist that everyone jumped, the doctor most of all. I've got it. I guess, Doc, I'd like your medical opinion on the plan I'm about to outline. Say Jane was to cross the herring pond again, and the same thing was to happen. The submarine, the sinking ship, everyone to take to the boats, and so on. Wouldn't that do the trick? Wouldn't it give a mighty big bump to her subconscious self, or whatever the jargon is, and start it functioning again right away? A very interesting speculation, Mr. Hersheimer. In my own opinion, it would be successful. It is unfortunate that there is no chance of the conditions repeating themselves as you suggest. Not by nature, perhaps, Doc. But I am talking about art. Art? Why, yes. What's the difficulty? Hire a liner. A liner, murmured Dr. Hall faintly. Hire some passengers, hire a submarine, that's the only difficulty, I guess. Governments are apt to be a bit hidebound over their engines of war. They won't sell to the first comer. Still, I guess that can be got over. Ever heard of the word graft, sir? Well, graft gets there every time. I reckon that we shan't really need to fire a torpedo. If everyone hustles round and screams loud enough that the ship is sinking, it ought to be enough for an innocent young girl like Jane. By the time she's got a life belt on her, and is being hustled into a boat, with a well-drilled lot of artists doing the hysterical stunt on deck, why, she ought to be right back where she was in May. 1915. How is that for the bare outline? Dr. Hall looked at Julius. Everything that he was for the moment incapable of saying was eloquent in that look. No, said Julius, in answer to it, I'm not crazy. The thing's perfectly possible. It's done every day in the States for the movies. Haven't you seen trains in collision on the screen? What's the difference between buying up a train and buying up a liner? Get the properties and you can go right ahead. Dr. Hall found his voice. But the expense, my dear sir. His voice rose. The expense. It will be colossal. Money doesn't worry me any, explained Julius simply. Dr. Hall turned an appealing face to Sir James, who smiled slightly. Mr. Hersheimer is very well off, very well off indeed. The doctor's glance came back to Julius with a new and subtle quality in it. This was no longer an eccentric young fellow with a habit of falling off trees. The doctor's eyes held the deference accorded to a really rich man. Very remarkable plan. Very remarkable, he murmured. The movies, of course. Your American word for the kinema. Very interesting. I fear we are perhaps a little behind the times over here in our methods. And you really mean to carry out this remarkable plan of yours? You bet your bottom dollar I do. The doctor believed him which was a tribute to his nationality. If an Englishman had suggested such a thing, he would have had grave doubts as to his sanity. I cannot guarantee a cure, he pointed out. Perhaps I ought to make that quite clear. Sure, that's all right, said Julius. You just trot out Jane, and leave the rest to me. Jane? Miss Janet Vondermeyer, then. Can we get on the long distance to your place right away, and ask them to send her up? or shall I run down and fetch her in my car? The doctor stared. I beg your pardon, Mr. Hersheimer. I thought you understood. Understood what? That Miss von der Meyer is no longer under my care. Chapter 15 Tuppence receives a proposal. Julius sprang up. What? I thought you were aware of that. When did she leave? Let me see. Today is Monday, is it not? It must have been last Wednesday, why, surely, yes, it was the same evening that you, er, uh, fell out of my tree. That evening? Before, or after? Let me see, oh yes, afterwards. A very urgent message arrived from Mrs. Vondermeyer. The young lady and the nurse who was in charge of her left by the night train. Julius sank back again into his chair. Nurse Edith, left with a patient, I remember, he muttered. My God, to have been so near. Dr. Hall looked bewildered. I don't understand. Is the young lady not with her aunt, after all? Tuppence shook her head. She was about to speak when a warning glance from Sir James made her hold her tongue. The lawyer rose. I'm much obliged to you, Hall. We're very grateful for all you've told us. I'm afraid we're now in the position of having to track Miss Vondermeyer anew. What about the nurse who accompanied her? I suppose you don't know where she is. The doctor shook his head. We've not heard from her, 
as it happens. I understood she was to remain with Miss Vondermeyer for a while. But what can have happened? Surely the girl has not been kidnapped. That remains to be seen, said Sir James gravely. The other hesitated. You do not think I ought to go to the police? No, no. In all probability the young lady is with other relations. The doctor was not completely satisfied, but he saw that Sir James was determined to say no more, and realized that to try and extract more information from the famous K.C. would be mere waste of labor. Accordingly, he wished them goodbye, and they left the hotel. For a few minutes they stood by the car talking. How maddening, cried Tuppence. To think that Julius must have been actually under the same roof with her for a few hours. I was a darned idiot, muttered Julius gloomily. You couldn't know, Tuppence consoled him. Could he? She appealed to Sir James. I should advise you not to worry, said the latter kindly. No use crying over spilt milk, you know. The great thing is what to do next, added Tuppence the practical. Sir James shrugged his shoulders. You might advertise for the nurse who accompanied the girl. That is the only course I can suggest, and I must confess I do not hope for much result. Otherwise there is nothing to be done. Nothing? said Tuppence blankly. And, Tommy? We must hope for the best, said Sir James. Oh yes, we must go on hoping. But over her downcast head his eyes met Julius's, and almost imperceptibly he shook his head. Julius understood. The lawyer considered the case hopeless. The young American's face grew grave. Sir James took Tuppence's hand. You must let me know if anything further comes to light. Letters will always be forwarded. Tuppence stared at him blankly. You are going away? I told you. Don't you remember? To Scotland. Yes, but I thought, the girl hesitated. Sir James shrugged his shoulders. My dear young lady, I can do nothing more. I fear. Our clues have all ended in thin air. You can take my word for it that there is nothing more to be done. If anything should arise, I shall be glad to advise you in any way I can. His words gave Tuppence an extraordinarily desolate feeling. I suppose you're right, she said. Anyway, thank you very much for trying to help us. Goodbye. Julius was bending over the car. A momentary pity came into Sir James's keen eyes, as he gazed into the girl's downcast face. Don't be too disconsolate, Miss Tuppence, he said in a low voice. Remember, holiday time isn't always all playtime. One sometimes manages to put in some work as well. Something in his tone made Tuppence glance up sharply. He shook his head with a smile. No, I shan't say any more. Great mistake to say too much. Remember that. Never tell all you know, not even to the person you know best. Understand? Goodbye. He strode away. Tuppence stared after him. She was beginning to understand Sir James's methods. Once before he had thrown her a hint in the same careless fashion. Was this a hint? What exactly lay behind those last brief words? Did he mean that, after all, he had not abandoned the case, that, secretly, he would be working on it still while? Her meditations were interrupted by Julius, who adjured her to get right in. You're looking kind of thoughtful, he remarked as they started off. Did the old guy say anything more? Tuppence opened her mouth impulsively, and then shut it again. Sir James's words sounded in her ears, never tell all you know, not even to the person you know best. And like a flash there came into her mind another memory. Julius before the safe in the flat, her own question and the pause before his reply, nothing. Was there really nothing? Or had he found something he wished to keep to himself? If he could make a reservation, so could she. Nothing particular, she replied. She felt rather than saw Julius throw a sideways glance at her. Say, shall we go for a spin in the park? If you like. For a while they ran on under the trees in silence. It was a beautiful day. The keen rush through the air brought a new exhilaration to Tuppence. Say, Miss Tuppence, do you think I'm ever going to find Jane? Julius spoke in a discouraged voice. The mood was so alien to him that Tuppence turned and stared at him in surprise. He nodded. That's so. I'm getting down and out over the business. Sir James today hadn't got any hope at all, I could see that. I don't like him, we don't gee together somehow, but he's pretty cute, and I guess he wouldn't quit if there was any chance of success, now, would he? Tuppence felt rather uncomfortable, 
but clinging to her belief that Julius also had withheld something from her, she remained firm. He suggested advertising for the nurse, she reminded him. Yes, with a forlorn hope flavor to his voice. No, I'm about fed up. I've half a mind to go back to the States right away. Oh no! cried Tuppence. We've got to find Tommy. I sure forgot Beresford, said Julius contritely. That's so. We must find him. But after, well, I've been daydreaming ever since I started on this trip, and these dreams are rotten poor business. I'm quit of them. Say, Miss Tuppence, there's something I'd like to ask you. Yes, you and Beresford. What about it? I don't understand you, replied Tuppence with dignity, adding rather inconsequently, and, anyway, you're wrong. Not got a sort of kindly feeling for one another? Certainly not, said Tuppence with warmth. Tommy and I are friends, nothing more. I guess every pair of lovers has said that sometime or another, observed Julius. Nonsense! snapped Tuppence. Do I look the sort of girl that's always falling in love with every man she meets? You do not. You look the sort of girl that's mighty often getting fallen in love with. Oh! said Tuppence, rather taken aback. That's a compliment, I suppose? Sure. Now let's get down to this. Supposing we never find Beresford and, and. All right, say it. I can face facts. Supposing he's dead. Well? And all this business fiddles out. What are you going to do? I don't know, said Tuppence forlornly. You'll be darned lonesome, you poor kid. I shall be all right, snapped Tuppence with her usual resentment of any kind of pity. What about marriage? inquired Julius. Got any views on the subject? I intend to marry, of course, replied Tuppence. That is, if she paused, knew a momentary longing to draw back, and then stuck to her guns bravely, I can find someone rich enough to make it worth my while. That's frank, isn't it? I dare say you despise me for it. I never despise business instinct, said Julius. What particular figure have you in mind? Figure? asked Tuppence, puzzled. Do you mean tall or short? No. Some, income. Oh, I, I haven't quite worked that out. What about me? You? Sure thing. Oh, I couldn't. Why not? I tell you I couldn't. Again, why not? It would seem so unfair. I don't see anything unfair about it. I call your bluff, that's all. I admire you immensely, Miss Tuppence, more than any girl I've ever met. You're so darned plucky. I'd just love to give you a real, rattling good time. Say the word, and we'll run round right away to some high-class jeweler, and fix up the ring business. I can't, gasped Tuppence. Because of Beresford. No, no, no. Well then? Tuppence merely continued to shake her head violently. You can't reasonably expect more dollars than I've got. Oh, it isn't that, gasped Tuppence with an almost hysterical laugh but thanking you very much, and all that, I think I'd better say no. I'd be obliged if you'd do me the favor to think it over until tomorrow. It's no use. Still, I guess we'll leave it like that. Very well, said Tuppence meekly. Neither of them spoke again until they reached the Ritz. Tuppence went upstairs to her room. She felt morally battered to the ground after her conflict with Julius's vigorous personality. Sitting down in front of the glass, she stared at her own reflection for some minutes. Fool, murmured Tuppence at length, making a grimace. Little fool. Everything you want, everything you've ever hoped for, and you go and bleat out no like an idiotic little sheep. It's your one chance. Why don't you take it? Grab it? Snatch at it? What more do you want? As if in answer to her own question, her eyes fell on a small snapshot of Tommy that stood on her dressing table in a shabby frame. For a moment she struggled for self-control, and then abandoning all presence, she held it to her lips and burst into a fit of sobbing. Oh, Tommy, Tommy, she cried, I do love you so, and I may never see you again. At the end of five minutes Tuppence sat up, blew her nose, and pushed back her hair. That's that, she observed sternly. Let's look facts in the face. I seem to have fallen in love, with an idiot of a boy who probably doesn't care two straws about me. Here she paused. Anyway, she resumed, as though arguing with an unseen opponent, I don't know that he does. 
he'd never have dared to say so. I've always jumped on sentiment, and here I am being more sentimental than anybody. What idiots girls are. I've always thought so. I suppose I shall sleep with his photograph under my pillow, and dream about him all night. It's dreadful to feel you've been false to your principles. Tuppence shook her head sadly, as she reviewed her backsliding. I don't know what to say to Julius, I'm sure. Oh, what a fool I feel. I'll have to say something, he's so American and thorough, he'll insist upon having a reason. I wonder if he did find anything in that safe. Tuppence's meditations went off on another tack. She reviewed the events of last night carefully and persistently. Somehow, they seemed bound up with Sir James's enigmatical words. Suddenly she gave a great start, the color faded out of her face. Her eyes, fascinated, gazed in front of her, the pupils dilated. Impossible, she murmured. Impossible. I must be going mad even to think of such a thing. Monstrous, yet it explained everything. After a moment's reflection she sat down and wrote a note, weighing each word as she did so. Finally she nodded her head as though satisfied, and slipped it into an envelope which she addressed to Julius. She went down the passage to his sitting room and knocked at the door. As she had expected, the room was empty. She left the note on the table. A small page boy was waiting outside her own door when she returned to it. Telegram for you, miss. Tuppence took it from the salver, and tore it open carelessly. Then she gave a cry. The telegram was from Tommy. Chapter 16 Further Adventures of Tommy From a darkness punctuated with throbbing stabs of fire, Tommy dragged his senses slowly back to life. When he at last opened his eyes, he was conscious of nothing but an excruciating pain through his temples. He was vaguely aware of unfamiliar surroundings. Where was he? What had happened? He blinked feebly. This was not his bedroom at the Ritz. And what the devil was the matter with his head? Damn! said Tommy, and tried to sit up. He had remembered. He was in that sinister house in Soho. He uttered a groan and fell back. Through his almost closed lids he reconnoitered carefully. He is coming to, remarked a voice very near Tommy's ear. He recognized it at once for that of the bearded and efficient German, and lay artistically inert. He felt that it would be a pity to come round too soon, and until the pain in his head became a little less acute, he felt quite incapable of collecting his wits. Painfully he tried to puzzle out what had happened. Obviously somebody must have crept up behind him as he listened and struck him down with a blow on the head. They knew him now for a spy, and would in all probability give him short shrift. Undoubtedly he was in a tight place. Nobody knew where he was, therefore he need expect no outside assistance, and must depend solely on his own wits. Well, here goes, murmured Tommy to himself, and repeated his former remark. Damn! He observed, and this time succeeded in sitting up. In a minute the German stepped forward and placed a glass to his lips, with a brief command drink. Tommy obeyed. The potency of the draught made him choke, but it cleared his brain in a marvelous manner. He was lying on a couch in the room in which the meeting had been held. On one side of him was the German, on the other the villainous faced doorkeeper who had let him in. The others were grouped together at a little distance away. But Tommy missed one face. The man known as Number One was no longer of the company. Feel better? asked the German, as he removed the empty glass. Yes, thanks, returned Tommy cheerfully. Ah, my young friend, it is lucky for you your skull is so thick. The good Conrad struck hard. He indicated the evil-faced doorkeeper by a nod. The man grinned. Tommy twisted his head round with an effort. Oh, he said, so you're Conrad, are you? It strikes me the thickness of my skull was lucky for you too. When I look at you I feel it's almost a pity I've enabled you to cheat the hangman. The man snarled, and the bearded man said quietly. He would have run no risk of that. Just as you like, replied Tommy. I know it's the fashion to run down the police. I rather believe in them myself. His manner was nonchalant to the last degree. Tommy Beresford was one of those young Englishmen not distinguished by any special intellectual ability, but who are emphatically at their best in what is known as a tight place. Their natural diffidence and caution fall from them like a glove. Tommy realized perfectly that in his own wits lay the only chance of escape, and behind his casual manner he was racking his brains furiously. The cold accents of the German took up the conversation. Have you anything to say before you are put to death as a spy? 
Simply lots of things, replied Tommy with the same urbanity as before. Do you deny that you were listening at that door? I do not. I must really apologize, but your conversation was so interesting that it overcame my scruples. How did you get in? Dear old Conrad here. Tommy smiled deprecatingly at him. I hesitate to suggest pensioning off a faithful servant, but you really ought to have a better watchdog. Conrad snarled impotently, and said sullenly, as the man with the beard swung round upon him. He gave the word. How was I to know? Yes, Tommy chimed in. How was he to know? Don't blame the poor fellow. His hasty action has given me the pleasure of seeing you all face to face. He fancied that his words caused some discomposure among the group, but the watchful German still did with a wave of his hand. Dead men tell no tales, he said evenly. Ah, said Tommy, but I'm not dead yet. You soon will be, my young friend, said the German. An assenting murmur came from the others. Tommy's heart beat faster, but his casual pleasantness did not waver. I think not, he said firmly. I should have a great objection to dying. He had got them puzzled, he saw that by the look on his captor's face. Can you give us any reason why we should not put you to death? asked the German. Several, replied Tommy. Look here, you've been asking me a lot of questions. Let me ask you one for a change. Why didn't you kill me off at once before I regained consciousness? The German hesitated, and Tommy seized his advantage. Because you didn't know how much I knew, and where I obtained that knowledge. If you kill me now, you never will know. But here the emotions of Boris became too much for him. He stepped forward waving his arms. You hellhound of a spy, he screamed. We will give you short shrift. Kill him. Kill him. There was a roar of applause. You hear? Said the German, his eyes on Tommy. What have you to say to that? Say? Tommy shrugged his shoulders. Pack of fools. Let them ask themselves a few questions. How did I get into this place? Remember what dear old Conrad said, with your own password, wasn't it? How did I get hold of that? You don't suppose I came up those steps haphazard and said the first thing that came into my head? Tommy was pleased with the concluding words of this speech. His only regret was that Tuppence was not present to appreciate its full flavor. That is true, said the working man suddenly. Comrades, we have been betrayed. An ugly murmur arose. Tommy smiled at them encouragingly. That's better. How can you hope to make a success of any job if you don't use your brains? You will tell us who has betrayed us, said the German. But that shall not save you, oh, no. You shall tell us all that you know. Boris, here, knows pretty ways of making people speak. Bah, said Tommy scornfully, fighting down a singularly unpleasant feeling in the pit of his stomach. You will neither torture me nor kill me. And why not? asked Boris. Because you'd kill the goose that lays the golden eggs, replied Tommy quietly. There was a momentary pause. It seemed as though Tommy's persistent assurance was at last conquering. They were no longer completely sure of themselves. The man in the shabby clothes stared at Tommy searchingly. He's bluffing you, Boris, he said quietly. Tommy hated him. Had the man seen through him? The German, with an effort, turned roughly to Tommy. What do you mean? What do you think I mean? parried Tommy, searching desperately in his own mind. Suddenly Boris stepped forward, and shook his fist in Tommy's face. Speak, you swine of an Englishman, speak. Don't get so excited, my good fellow, said Tommy calmly. That's the worst of you foreigners. You can't keep calm. Now, I ask you, do I look as though I thought there were the least chance of your killing me? He looked confidently round, and was glad they could not hear the persistent beating of his heart which gave the light to his words. No, admitted Boris at last sullenly, you do not. Thank God, he's not a mind reader, thought Tommy. Aloud he pursued his advantage. And why am I so confident? Because I know something that puts me in a position to propose a bargain. A bargain? The bearded man took him up sharply. Yes, a bargain. My life and liberty against, he paused. Against what? The group pressed forward. You could have heard a pin drop. Slowly Tommy spoke. The papers that Danvers brought over from America in the Lusitania. The effect of his words was electrical. Everyone was on his feet. The German waved them back. He leaned over Tommy, 
his face purple with excitement. Himmel. You have got them, then? With magnificent calm Tommy shook his head. You know where they are? persisted the German. Again Tommy shook his head. Not in the least. Then, then, angry and baffled, the words failed him. Tommy looked round. He saw anger and bewilderment on every face, but his calm assurance had done its work, no one doubted but that something lay behind his words. I don't know where the papers are, but I believe that I can find them. I have a theory. Pa. Tommy raised his hand, and silenced the clamors of disgust. I call it a theory, but I am pretty sure of my facts, facts that are known to no one but myself. In any case what do you lose? If I can produce the papers, you give me my life and liberty in exchange. Is it a bargain? And if we refuse? said the German quietly. Tommy lay back on the couch. The twenty-ninth, he said thoughtfully, is less than a fortnight ahead. For a moment the German hesitated. Then he made a sign to Conrad. Take him into the other room. For five minutes, Tommy sat on the bed in the dingy room next door. His heart was beating violently. He had risked all on this throw. How would they decide? And all the while that this agonized questioning went on within him, he talked flippantly to Conrad, enraging the cross-grained doorkeeper to the point of homicidal mania. At last the door opened, and the German called imperiously to Conrad to return. Let's hope the judge hasn't put his black cap on, remarked Tommy frivolously. That's right, Conrad, march me in. The prisoner is at the bar, gentlemen. The German was seated once more behind the table. He motioned to Tommy to sit down opposite to him. We accept, he said harshly, on terms. The papers must be delivered to us before you go free. Idiot, said Tommy amiably. How do you think I can look for them if you keep me tied by the leg here? What do you expect, then? I must have liberty to go about the business in my own way. The German laughed. Do you think we are little children to let you walk out of here leaving us a pretty story full of promises? No, said Tommy thoughtfully. Though infinitely simpler for me, I did not really think you would agree to that plan. Very well, we must arrange a compromise. How would it be if you attached little Conrad here to my person? He's a faithful fellow, and very ready with the fist. We prefer, said the German coldly, that you should remain here. One of our number will carry out your instructions minutely. If the operations are complicated, he will return to you with a report and you can instruct him further. You're tying my hands, complained Tommy. It's a very delicate affair, and the other fellow will muff it up as likely as not, and then where shall I be? I don't believe one of you has got an ounce of tact. The German rapped the table. Those are our terms. Otherwise, death. Tommy leaned back wearily. I like your style. Curt, but attractive. So be it, then. But one thing is essential, I must see the girl. What girl? Jane Finn, of course. The other looked at him curiously for some minutes, then he said slowly, and as though choosing his words with care. Do you not know that she can tell you nothing? Tommy's heart beat a little faster. Would he succeed in coming face to face with the girl he was seeking? I shall not ask her to tell me anything he said quietly. Not in so many words, that is. Then why see her? Tommy paused. To watch her face when I ask her one question, he replied at last. Again there was a look in the German's eyes that Tommy did not quite understand. She will not be able to answer your question. That does not matter. I shall have seen her face when I ask it. And you think that will tell you anything? He gave a short disagreeable laugh. More than ever, Tommy felt that there was a factor somewhere that he did not understand. The German looked at him searchingly. I wonder whether, after all, you know as much as we think? He said softly. Tommy felt his ascendancy less sure than the moment before. His hold had slipped a little. But he was puzzled. What had he said wrong? He spoke out on the impulse of the moment. There may be things that you know which I do not. I have not pretended to be aware of all the details of your show. But equally I've got something up my sleeve that you don't know about. And that's where I mean to score. Danvers was a damned clever fellow, he broke off as if he had said too much. But the German's face had lightened a little. Danvers, he murmured. I see, he paused a minute, then waved to Conrad. Take him away. Upstairs, you know. Wait a minute, said Tommy. What about the girl? 
That may perhaps be arranged. It must be. We will see about it. Only one person can decide that. Who? asked Tommy. But he knew the answer. Mr. Brown. Shall I see him? Perhaps. Come, said Conrad harshly. Tommy rose obediently. Outside the door his jailer motioned to him to mount the stairs. He himself followed close behind. On the floor above Conrad opened a door and Tommy passed into a small room. Conrad lit a hissing gas burner and went out. Tommy heard the sound of the key being turned in the lock. He set to work to examine his prison. It was a smaller room than the one downstairs, and there was something peculiarly airless about the atmosphere of it. Then he realized that there was no window. He walked round it. The walls were filthily dirty, as everywhere else. Four pictures hung crookedly on the wall representing scenes from Faust. Marguerite with her box of jewels, the church scene, Zebel and his flowers, and Faust and Mephistopheles. The latter brought Tommy's mind back to Mr. Brown again. In this sealed and closed chamber, with its close-fitting heavy door, he felt cut off from the world, and the sinister power of the arch-criminal seemed more real. Shout as he would, no one could ever hear him. The place was a living tomb. With an effort Tommy pulled himself together. He sank onto the bed and gave himself up to reflection. His head ached badly, also, he was hungry. The silence of the place was dispiriting. Anyway, said Tommy, trying to cheer himself, I shall see the chief, the mysterious Mr. Brown and with a bit of luck in bluffing I shall see the mysterious Jane Finn also. After that. After that Tommy was forced to admit the prospect looked dreary. Chapter 17 Annette The troubles of the future, however, soon faded before the troubles of the present. And of these, the most immediate and pressing was that of hunger. Tommy had a healthy and vigorous appetite. The steak and chips partaken of for lunch seemed now to belong to another decade. He regretfully recognized the fact that he would not make a success of a hunger strike. He prowled aimlessly about his prison. Once or twice he discarded dignity, and pounded on the door. But nobody answered the summons. Hang it all, said Tommy indignantly. They can't mean to starve me to death. A newborn fear passed through his mind that this might, perhaps, be one of those pretty ways of making a prisoner speak which had been attributed to Boris. But on reflection he dismissed the idea. It's that sour-faced brute Conrad, he decided. That's a fellow I shall enjoy getting even with one of these days. This is just a bit of spite on his part. I'm certain of it. Further meditations induced in him the feeling that it would be extremely pleasant to bring something down with a whack on Conrad's egg-shaped head. Tommy stroked his own head tenderly, and gave himself up to the pleasures of imagination. Finally a bright idea flashed across his brain. Why not convert imagination into reality? Conrad was undoubtedly the tenant of the house. The others, with the possible exception of the bearded German, merely used it as a rendezvous. Therefore, why not wait in ambush for Conrad behind the door, and when he entered bring down a chair, or one of the decrepit pictures, smartly onto his head? One would, of course, be careful not to hit too hard. And then, and then, simply walk out. If he met anyone on the way down, well, Tommy brightened at the thought of an encounter with his fists. Such an affair was infinitely more in his line than the verbal encounter of this afternoon. Intoxicated by his plan, Tommy gently unhooked the picture of the devil and Faust, and settled himself in position. His hopes were high. The plan seemed to him simple but excellent. Time went on, but Conrad did not appear. Night and day were the same in this prison room. But Tommy's wristwatch, which enjoyed a certain degree of accuracy, informed him that it was nine o'clock in the evening. Tommy reflected gloomily that if supper did not arrive soon it would be a question of waiting for breakfast. At ten o'clock hope deserted him, and he flung himself on the bed to seek consolation in sleep. In five minutes his woes were forgotten. The sound of the key turning in the lock awoke him from his slumbers. Not belonging to the type of hero who is famous for awaking in full possession of his faculties, Tommy merely blinked at the ceiling and wondered vaguely where he was. Then he remembered, and looked at his watch. It was eight o'clock. It's either early morning tea or breakfast, deduced the young man, and pray God it's the latter. The door swung open. Too late, Tommy remembered his scheme of obliterating the unprepossessing Conrad. A moment later he was glad that he had, for it was not Conrad who entered but a girl. She carried a tray which she set down on the table. 
In the feeble light of the gas burner Tommy blinked at her. He decided at once that she was one of the most beautiful girls he had ever seen. Her hair was a full rich brown, with sudden glints of gold in it as though there were imprisoned sunbeams struggling in its depths. There was a wild rose quality about her face. Her eyes, set wide apart, were hazel, a golden hazel that again recalled a memory of sunbeams. A delirious thought shot through Tommy's mind. Are you Jane Finn? he asked breathlessly. The girl shook her head wonderingly. My name is Annette, monsieur. She spoke in a soft, broken English. Oh, said Tommy, rather taken aback. Frances? he hazarded. Oui, monsieur. Monsieur parle français? Not for any length of time, said Tommy. What's that? Breakfast? The girl nodded. Tommy dropped off the bed and came and inspected the contents of the tray. It consisted of a loaf, some margarine, and a jug of coffee. The living is not equal to the Ritz, he observed with a sigh. But for what we are at last about to receive the Lord has made me truly thankful. Amen. He drew up a chair, and the girl turned away to the door. Wait a second, cried Tommy. There are lots of things I want to ask you, Annette. What are you doing in this house? Don't tell me you're Conrad's niece, or daughter, or anything, because I can't believe it. I do the service, monsieur. I am not related to anybody. I see, said Tommy. You know what I asked you just now. Have you ever heard that name? I have heard people speak of Jane Finn, I think. You don't know where she is? Annette shook her head. She's not in this house, for instance. Oh no, monsieur. I must go now, they will be waiting for me. She hurried out. The key turned in the lock. I wonder who they are, mused Tommy, as he continued to make inroads on the loaf. With a bit of luck, the girl might help me to get out of here. She doesn't look like one of the gang. At one o'clock Annette reappeared with another tray, but this time Conrad accompanied her. Good morning, said Tommy amiably. You have not used Pear's soap, I see. Conrad growled threateningly. No light repartee, have you, old bean? There, there, we can't always have brains as well as beauty. What have we for lunch? Stew? How did I know? Elementary, my dear Watson, the smell of onions is unmistakable. Talk away, grunted the man. It's little enough time you'll have to talk in, maybe. The remark was unpleasant in its suggestion, but Tommy ignored it. He sat down at the table. Retire, Violet, he said, with a wave of his hand. Pratt not to thy betters. That evening Tommy sat on the bed, and cogitated deeply. Would Conrad again accompany the girl? If he did not, should he risk trying to make an ally of her? He decided that he must leave no stone unturned. His position was desperate. At eight o'clock the familiar sound of the key turning made him spring to his feet. The girl was alone. Shut the door, he commanded. I want to speak to you. She obeyed. Look here, Annette, I want you to help me get out of this. She shook her head. Impossible. There are three of them on the floor below. Oh, Tommy was secretly grateful for the information. But you would help me if you could? No, monsieur. Why not? The girl hesitated. I think, they are my own people. You have spied upon them. They are quite right to keep you here. They're a bad lot, Annette. If you'll help me, I'll take you away from the lot of them. And you'd probably get a good whack of money. But the girl merely shook her head. I dare not, monsieur, I am afraid of them. She turned away. Wouldn't you do anything to help another girl? Cried Tommy. She's about your age too. Won't you save her from their clutches? You mean Jane Finn? Yes. It is her you came here to look for? Yes? That's it. The girl looked at him, then passed her hand across her forehead. Jane Finn. Always I hear that name. It is familiar. Tommy came forward eagerly. You must know something about her. But the girl turned away abruptly. I know nothing, only the name. She walked towards the door. Suddenly she uttered a cry. Tommy stared. She had caught sight of the picture he had laid against the wall the night before. For a moment he caught a look of terror in her eyes. As inexplicably it changed to relief. Then abruptly she went out of the room. Tommy could make nothing of it. Did she fancy that he had meant to attack her with it? Surely not. He rehung the picture on the wall thoughtfully. 
Three more days went by and dreary inaction. Tommy felt the strain telling on his nerves. He saw no one but Conrad and Annette, and the girl had become dumb. She spoke only in monosyllables. A kind of dark suspicion smoldered in her eyes. Tommy felt that if this solitary confinement went on much longer he would go mad. He gathered from Conrad that they were waiting for orders from Mr. Brown. Perhaps, thought Tommy, he was abroad or away, and they were obliged to wait for his return. But the evening of the third day brought a rude awakening. It was barely seven o'clock when he heard the tramp of footsteps outside in the passage. In another minute the door was flung open. Conrad entered. With him was the evil-looking number fourteen. Tommy's heart sank at the sight of them. Evening, Governor, said the man with a leer. Got those ropes, mate? The silent Conrad produced a length of fine cord. The next minute number fourteen's hands, horribly dexterous, were winding the cord round his limbs, while Conrad held him down. What the devil? began Tommy. But the slow, speechless grin of the silent Conrad froze the words on his lips. Number fourteen proceeded deftly with his task. In another minute Tommy was a mere helpless bundle. Then at last Conrad spoke. Thought you'd bluffed us, did you? With what you knew, and what you didn't know. Bargained with us. And all the time it was bluff. Bluff. You know less than a kitten. But your number's up now all right, you be, swine. Tommy lay silent. There was nothing to say. He had failed. Somehow or other the omnipotent Mr. Brown had seen through his pretensions. Suddenly a thought occurred to him. A very good speech, comrade, he said approvingly. But where for the bonds and fetters? Why not let this kind gentleman here cut my throat without delay? Khan, said number fourteen unexpectedly. Think we're as green as to do in here, and have the police nosing round? Not Alf. We've ordered the carriage for your lordship tomorrow morning, but in the meantime we're not taking any chances, see? Nothing, said Tommy, could be plainer than your words, unless it was your face. Stow it, said number fourteen. With pleasure, replied Tommy. You're making a sad mistake, but yours will be the loss. You don't kid us that way again, said number fourteen. Talking as though you were still at the blooming Ritz, aren't you? Tommy made no reply. He was engaged in wondering how Mr. Brown had discovered his identity. He decided that Tuppence, in the throes of anxiety, had gone to the police, and that his disappearance having been made public the gang had not been slow to put two and two together. The two men departed and the door slammed. Tommy was left to his meditations. They were not pleasant ones. Already his limbs felt cramped and stiff. He was utterly helpless, and he could see no hope anywhere. About an hour had passed when he heard the key softly turned, and the door opened. It was Annette. Tommy's heart beat a little faster. He had forgotten the girl. Was it possible that she had come to his help? Suddenly he heard Conrad's voice. Come out of it, Annette. He doesn't want any supper tonight. We, oui, we, oui, je sais bien. But I must take the other tray. We need the things on it. Well, hurry up, growled Conrad. Without looking at Tommy the girl went over to the table, and picked up the tray. She raised a hand and turned out the light. Curse you Conrad had come to the door, why did you do that? I always turn it out. You should have told me. Shall I relight it, Monsieur Conrad? No, come on out of it. Le beau petit Monsieur, cried Annette, pausing by the bed in the darkness. You have tied him up well, Hein? He is like a trussed chicken. The frank amusement in her tone jarred on the boy, but at that moment, to his amazement, he felt her hand running lightly over his bonds, and something small and cold was pressed into the palm of his hand. Come on, Annette. Mais me voilà. The door shut. Tommy heard Conrad say. Lock it and give me the key. The footsteps died away. Tommy lay petrified with amazement. The object Annette had thrust into his hand was a small penknife, the blade open. From the way she had studiously avoided looking at him, and her action with the light, he came to the conclusion that the room was overlooked. There must be a peephole somewhere in the walls. Remembering how guarded she had always been in her manner, he saw that he had probably been under observation all the time. Had he said anything to give himself away? Hardly. He had revealed a wish to escape and a desire to find Jane Finn, but nothing that could have given a clue to his own identity. True. His question to Annette had proved that he was personally unacquainted with Jane Finn, 
but he had never pretended otherwise. The question now was, did Annette really know more? Were her denials intended primarily for the listeners? On that point he could come to no conclusion. But there was a more vital question that drove out all others. Could he, bound as he was, manage to cut his bonds? He essayed cautiously to rub the open blade up and down on the cord that bound his two wrists together. It was an awkward business, and drew a smothered dough of pain from him as the knife cut into his wrist. But slowly and doggedly he went on sawing to and fro. He cut the flesh badly, but at last he felt the cord slacken. With his hands free, the rest was easy. Five minutes later he stood upright with some difficulty, owing to the cramp in his limbs. His first care was to bind up his bleeding wrist. Then he sat on the edge of the bed to think. Conrad had taken the key of the door, so he could expect little more assistance from Annette. The only outlet from the room was the door, consequently he would perforce have to wait until the two men returned to fetch him. But when they did, Tommy smiled. Moving with infinite caution in the dark room, he found and unhooked the famous picture. He felt an economical pleasure that his first plan would not be wasted. There was now nothing to do but to wait. He waited. The night passed slowly. Tommy lived through an eternity of hours, but at last he heard footsteps. He stood upright, drew a deep breath, and clutched the picture firmly. The door opened. A faint light streamed in from outside. Conrad went straight towards the gas to light it. Tommy deeply regretted that it was he who had entered first. It would have been pleasant to get even with Conrad. Number 14 followed. As he stepped across the threshold, Tommy brought the picture down with terrific force on his head. Number 14 went down amidst a stupendous crash of broken glass. In a minute Tommy had slipped out and pulled to the door. The key was in the lock. He turned it and withdrew it just as Conrad hurled himself against the door from the inside with a volley of curses. For a moment Tommy hesitated. There was the sound of someone stirring on the floor below. Then the German's voice came up the stairs. Got him Himmel. Conrad, what is it? Tommy felt a small hand thrust into his. Beside him stood Annette. She pointed up a rickety ladder that apparently led to some attics. Quick, up here. She dragged him after her up the ladder. In another moment they were standing in a dusty garret littered with lumber. Tommy looked round. This won't do. It's a regular trap. There's no way out. Hush. Wait. The girl put her finger to her lips. She crept to the top of the ladder and listened. The banging and beating on the door was terrific. The German and another were trying to force the door in. Annette explained in a whisper. They will think you are still inside. They cannot hear what Conrad says. The door is too thick. I thought you could hear what went on in the room. There is a peephole into the next room. It was clever of you to guess. But they will not think of that, they are only anxious to get in. Yes, but look here. Leave it to me. She bent down. To his amazement, Tommy saw that she was fastening the end of a long piece of string to the handle of a big cracked jug. She arranged it carefully, then turned to Tommy. Have you the key of the door? Yes. Give it to me. He handed it to her. I am going down. Do you think you can go halfway, and then swing yourself down behind the ladder, so that they will not see you? Tommy nodded. There's a big cupboard in the shadow of the landing. Stand behind it. Take the end of this string in your hand. When I've let the others out, pull. Before he had time to ask her anything more, she had flitted lightly down the ladder and was in the midst of the group with a loud cry. Mon Dieu! Mon Dieu! Qu'est-ce qu'il y a? The German turned on her with an oath. Get out of this. Go to your room. Very cautiously Tommy swung himself down the back of the ladder. So long as they did not turn round, all was well. He crouched behind the cupboard. They were still between him and the stairs. Ah! Annette appeared to stumble over something. She stooped. Mon Dieu, voilà la clef. The German snatched it from her. He unlocked the door. Conrad stumbled out, swearing. Where is he? Have you got him? We have seen no one, said the German sharply. His face paled. Who do you mean? Conrad gave vent to another oath. He's got away. Impossible. He would have passed us. At that moment, with an ecstatic smile Tommy pulled the string. A crash of crockery came from the attic above. In a trice the men were pushing each other up the rickety ladder and had disappeared into the darkness above.
quick as a flash Tommy leapt from his hiding place and dashed down the stairs, pulling the girl with him. There was no one in the hall. He fumbled over the bolts and chain. At last they yielded, the door swung open. He turned. Annette had disappeared. Tommy stood spellbound. Had she run upstairs again? What madness possessed her? He fumed with impatience, but he stood his ground. He would not go without her. And suddenly there was an outcry overhead, an exclamation from the German, and then Annette's voice, clear and high. Ma foi, he has escaped. And quickly. Who would have thought it? Tommy still stood rooted to the ground. Was that a command to him to go? He fancied it was. And then, louder still, the words floated down to him. This is a terrible house. I want to go back to Marguerite. To Marguerite. To Marguerite. Tommy had run back to the stairs. She wanted him to go and leave her. But why? At all costs he must try and get her away with him. Then his heart sank. Conrad was leaping down the stairs, uttering a savage cry at the sight of him. After him came the others. Tommy stopped Conrad's rush with a straight blow with his fist. It caught the other on the point of the jaw and he fell like a log. The second man tripped over his body and fell. From higher up the staircase there was a flash, and a bullet grazed Tommy's ear. He realized that it would be good for his health to get out of this house as soon as possible. As regards Annette he could do nothing. He had got even with Conrad, which was one satisfaction. The blow had been a good one. He leapt for the door, slamming it behind him. The square was deserted. In front of the house was a baker's van. Evidently he was to have been taken out of London in that, and his body found many miles from the house in Soho. The driver jumped to the pavement and tried to bar Tommy's way. Again Tommy's fist shot out, and the driver sprawled on the pavement. Tommy took to his heels and ran, none too soon. The front door opened and a hail of bullets followed him. Fortunately none of them hit him. He turned the corner of the square. There's one thing, he thought to himself, they can't go on shooting. They'll have the police after them if they do. I wonder they dared to there. He heard the footsteps of his pursuers behind him, and redoubled his own pace. Once he got out of these byways he would be safe. There would be a policeman about somewhere, not that he really wanted to invoke the aid of the police if he could possibly do without it. It meant explanations, and general awkwardness. In another moment he had reason to bless his luck. He stumbled over a prostrate figure, which started up with a yell of alarm and dashed off down the street. Tommy drew back into a doorway. In a minute he had the pleasure of seeing his two pursuers, of whom the German was one, industriously tracking down the red herring. Tommy sat down quietly on the doorstep and allowed a few moments to elapse while he recovered his breath. Then he strolled gently in the opposite direction. He glanced at his watch. It was a little after half past five. It was rapidly growing light. At the next corner he passed a policeman. The policeman cast a suspicious eye on him. Tommy felt slightly offended. Then, passing his hand over his face, he laughed. He had not shaved or washed for three days. What a guy he must look. He betook himself without more ado to a Turkish bath establishment which he knew to be open all night. He emerged into the busy daylight feeling himself once more, and able to make plans. First of all, he must have a square meal. He had eaten nothing since midday yesterday. He turned into an A, B, C, shop and ordered eggs and bacon and coffee. Whilst he ate, he read a morning paper propped up in front of him. Suddenly he stiffened. There was a long article on Kramanin, who was described as the man behind Bolshevism in Russia, and who had just arrived in London, some thought as an unofficial envoy. His career was sketched lightly, and it was firmly asserted that he, and not the figurehead leaders, had been the author of the Russian Revolution. In the center of the page was his portrait. So that's who number one is, said Tommy with his mouth full of eggs and bacon. Not a doubt about it, I must push on. He paid for his breakfast, and betook himself to Whitehall. There he sent up his name, and the message that it was urgent. A few minutes later he was in the presence of the man who did not hear go by the name of Mr. Carter. There was a frown on his face. Look here, you've no business to come asking for me in this way. I thought that was distinctly understood. It was, sir. But I judged it important to lose no time. And as briefly and succinctly as possible he detailed the experiences of the last few days. Halfway through, Mr. Carter interrupted him to give a few cryptic orders through the telephone. 
All traces of displeasure had now left his face. He nodded energetically when Tommy had finished. Quite right. Every moment's of value. Fear we shall be too late anyway. They wouldn't wait. Would clear out at once. Still, they may have left something behind them that will be a clue. You say you've recognized number one to be Cramanon. That's important. We want something against him badly to prevent the cabinet falling on his neck too freely. What about the others? You say two faces were familiar to you? One's a labor man, you think? Just look through these photos, and see if you can spot him. A minute later, Tommy held one up. Mr. Carter exhibited some surprise. Ah, Westway. Shouldn't have thought it. Poses as being moderate. As for the other fellow, I think I can give a good guess. He handed another photograph to Tommy, and smiled at the other's exclamation. I'm right, then. Who is he? Irishman. Prominent Unionist MP all are blind, of course. We've suspected it, but couldn't get any proof. Yes, you've done very well, young man. The 29th, you say, is the date. That gives us very little time, very little time indeed. But, Tommy hesitated. Mr. Carter read his thoughts. We can deal with the general strike menace, I think. It's a toss-up, but we've got a sporting chance. But if that draft treaty turns up, we're done. England will be plunged in anarchy. Ah, what's that? The car? Come on, Beresford, we'll go and have a look at this house of yours. Two constables were on duty in front of the house in Soho. An inspector reported to Mr. Carter in a low voice. The latter turned to Tommy. The birds have flown, as we thought. We might as well go over it. Going over the deserted house seemed to Tommy to partake of the character of a dream. Everything was just as it had been. The prison room with the crooked pictures, the broken jug in the attic, the meeting room with its long table. But nowhere was there a trace of papers. Everything of that kind had either been destroyed or taken away. And there was no sign of Annette. What you tell me about the girl puzzled me, said Mr. Carter. You believe that she deliberately went back? It would seem so, sir. She ran upstairs while I was getting the door open. H.M., she must belong to the gang, then, but, being a woman, didn't feel like standing by to see a personable young man killed. But evidently she's in with them, or she wouldn't have gone back. I can't believe she's really one of them, sir. She, seemed so different. Good looking, I suppose? said Mr. Carter with a smile that made Tommy flush to the roots of his hair. He admitted Annette's beauty rather shamefacedly. By the way, observed Mr. Carter, have you shown yourself to Miss Tappence yet? She's been bombarding me with letters about you. Tappence? I was afraid she might get a bit rattled. Did she go to the police? Mr. Carter shook his head. Then I wonder how they twigged me. Mr. Carter looked inquiringly at him, and Tommy explained. The other nodded thoughtfully. True, that's rather a curious point. Unless the mention of the Ritz was an accidental remark? It might have been, sir. But they must have found out about me suddenly in some way. Well, said Mr. Carter, looking round him, there's nothing more to be done here. What about some lunch with me? Thanks awfully, sir. But I think I'd better get back and rout out Tuppence. Of course. Give her my kind regards and tell her not to believe you're killed too readily next time. Tommy grinned. I take a lot of killing, sir. So I perceive, said Mr. Carter dryly. Well, goodbye. Remember your remarked man now, and take reasonable care of yourself. Thank you, sir. Hailing a taxi briskly Tommy stepped in, and was swiftly borne to the Ritz, dwelling the while on the pleasurable anticipation of startling tuppence. Wonder what she's been up to. Dogging Rita most likely. By the way, I suppose that's who Annette meant by Marguerite. I didn't get it at the time. The thought saddened him a little, for it seemed to prove that Mrs. Vondermeyer and the girl were on intimate terms. The taxi drew up at the Ritz. Tommy burst into its sacred portals eagerly, but his enthusiasm received a check. He was informed that Miss Cowley had gone out a quarter of an hour ago. Chapter 18 The Telegram Baffled for the moment, Tommy strolled into the restaurant, and ordered a meal of surpassing excellence. His four days imprisonment had taught him anew to value good food. He was in the middle of conveying a particularly choice morsel of sola la to his mouth, when he caught sight of Julius entering the room. 
Tommy waved a menu cheerfully, and succeeded in attracting the other's attention. At the sight of Tommy, Julius's eyes seemed as though they would pop out of his head. He strode across, and Pomp handled Tommy's hand with what seemed to the latter quite unnecessary vigor. Holy snakes! He ejaculated. Is it really you? Of course it is. Why shouldn't it be? Why shouldn't it be? Say, man, don't you know you've been given up for dead? I guess we'd have had a solemn requiem for you in another few days. Who thought I was dead? Demanded Tommy. Tuppence. She remembered the proverb about the good dying young, I suppose. There must be a certain amount of original sin in me to have survived. Where is Tuppence, by the way? Isn't she here? No, the fellows at the office said she'd just gone out. Gone shopping, I guess. I dropped her here in the car about an hour ago. But, say, can't you shed that British calm of yours, and get down to it? What on God's earth have you been doing all this time? If you're feeding here, replied Tommy, order now. It's going to be a long story. Julius drew up a chair to the opposite side of the table, summoned a hovering waiter, and dictated his wishes. Then he turned to Tommy. Fire ahead. I guess you've had some few adventures. One or two, replied Tommy modestly, and plunged into his recital. Julius listened spellbound. Half the dishes that were placed before him he forgot to eat. At the end he heaved a long sigh. Bully for you. Reads like a dime novel. And now for the home front, said Tommy, stretching out his hand for a peach. We all, drawled Julius, I don't mind admitting we've had some adventures too. He, in his turn, assumed the role of narrator. Beginning with his unsuccessful reconnoitering at Bournemouth, he passed on to his return to London, the buying of the car, the growing anxieties of Trappence, the call upon Sir James, and the sensational occurrences of the previous night. But who killed her? asked Tommy. I don't quite understand. The doctor kidded himself she took it herself, replied Julius dryly. And Sir James? What did he think? Being a legal luminary, he is likewise a human oyster, replied Julius. I should say he reserved judgment. He went on to detail the events of the morning. Lost her memory, eh? said Tommy with interest. By Jove, that explains why they looked at me so queerly when I spoke of questioning her. Bit of a slip on my part, that. But it wasn't the sort of thing a fellow would be likely to guess. They didn't give you any sort of hint as to where Jane was? Tommy shook his head regretfully. Not a word. I'm a bit of an ass, as you know. I ought to have got more out of them somehow. I guess you're lucky to be here at all. That bluff of yours was the goods all right. How you ever came to think of it all so pat beats me to a frazzle. I was in such a funk I had to think of something, said Tommy simply. There was a moment's pause, and then Tommy reverted to Mrs. Vondermeyer's death. There's no doubt it was chloral? I believe not. At least they call it heart failure induced by an overdose, or some such claptrap. It's all right. We don't want to be worried with an inquest. But I guess Tappence and I and even the highbrow Sir James have all got the same idea. Mr. Brown? Hazarded Tommy. Sure thing. Tommy nodded. All the same, he said thoughtfully, Mr. Brown hasn't got wings. I don't see how he got in and out. How about some high-class thought transference stunt? Some magnetic influence that irresistibly impelled Mrs. Vondemeyer to commit suicide? Tommy looked at him with respect. Good, Julius. Distinctly good. Especially the phraseology. But it leaves me cold. I yearn for a real Mr. Brown of flesh and blood. I think the gifted young detectives must get to work, study the entrances and exits, and tap the bumps on their foreheads until the solution of the mystery dawns on them. Let's go round to the scene of the crime. I wish we could get hold of Tuppence. The Ritz would enjoy the spectacle of the glad reunion. Inquiry at the office revealed the fact that Tuppence had not yet returned. All the same, I guess I'll have a look round upstairs, said Julius. She might be in my sitting room. He disappeared. Suddenly a diminutive boy spoke at Tommy's elbow. The young lady, she's gone away by train, I think, sir, he murmured shyly. What? Tommy wheeled round upon him. The small boy became pinker than before. The taxi, sir. I heard her tell the driver Charing Cross and to look sharp. Tommy stared at him, his eyes opening wide in surprise. Emboldened, the small boy proceeded. 
So I thought, having asked for an A, B, C, and a Bradshaw. Tommy interrupted him. When did she ask for an A, B, C, and a Bradshaw? When I took her the telegram, sir. A telegram? Yes, sir. When was that? About half past twelve, sir. Tell me exactly what happened. The small boy drew a long breath. I took up a telegram to know. 891, the lady was there. She opened it and gave a gasp, and then she said, very jolly like, bring me up a Bradshaw, and an A, B, C, and look sharp, Henry. My name isn't Henry, but... Never mind your name, said Tommy impatiently. Go on. Yes, sir. I brought them, and she told me to wait, and looked up something. And then she looks up at the clock, and hurry up, she says. Tell them to get me a taxi, and she begins a shoving on of her hat in front of the glass, and she was down in two ticks, almost as quick as I was, and I seed her going down the steps and into the taxi, and I heard her call out what I told you. The small boy stopped and replenished his lungs. Tommy continued to stare at him. At that moment Julius rejoined him. He held an open letter in his hand. I say, Hershimer Tommy turned to him, Tuppence has gone off sleuthing on her own. Shucks. Yes, she has. She went off in a taxi to Charing Cross in the deuce of a hurry after getting a telegram. His eye fell on the letter in Julius's hand. Oh, she left a note for you. That's all right. Where's she off to? Almost unconsciously, he held out his hand for the letter, but Julius folded it up and placed it in his pocket. He seemed a trifle embarrassed. I guess this is nothing to do with it. It's about something else, something I asked her that she was to let me know about. Oh. Tommy looked puzzled, and seemed waiting for more. See here, said Julius suddenly, I'd better put you wise. I asked Miss Tuppence to marry me this morning. Oh said Tommy mechanically. He felt dazed. Julius's words were totally unexpected. For the moment they benumbed his brain. I'd like to tell you, continued Julius, that before I suggested anything of the kind to Miss Tuppence, I made it clear that I didn't want to button in any way between her and you. Tommy roused himself. That's all right, he said quickly. Tuppence and I have been pals for years. Nothing more. He lit a cigarette with a hand that shook ever so little. That's quite all right. Tuppence always said that she was looking out for. He stopped abruptly, his face crimsoning, but Julius was in no way discomposed. Oh, I guess it'll be the dollars that'll do the trick. Miss Tuppence put me wise to that right away. There's no humbug about her. We ought to gee along together very well. Tommy looked at him curiously for a minute, as though he were about to speak, then changed his mind and said nothing. Tuppence and Julius. Well, why not? Had she not lamented the fact that she knew no rich men? Had she not openly avowed her intention of marrying for money if she ever had the chance? Her meeting with the young American millionaire had given her the chance, and it was unlikely she would be slow to avail herself of it. She was out for money. She had always said so. Why blame her because she had been true to her creed? Nevertheless, Tommy did blame her. He was filled with a passionate and utterly illogical resentment. It was all very well to say things like that. But a real girl would never marry for money. Tuppence was utterly cold-blooded and selfish, and he would be delighted if he never saw her again. And it was a rotten world. Julius's voice broke in on these meditations. Yes, we ought to gee along together very well. I've heard that a girl always refuses you once, a sort of convention. Tommy caught his arm. Refuses? Did you say refuses? Sure thing. Didn't I tell you that? She just rapped out a no without any kind of reason to it. The eternal feminine, the hands call it, I've heard. But she'll come round right enough. Likely enough, I hustled her some. But Tommy interrupted regardless of decorum. What did she say in that note? He demanded fiercely. The obliging Julius handed it to him. There's no earthly clue in it as to where she's gone, he assured Tommy. But you might as well see for yourself if you don't believe me. The note. In Tuppence's well-known schoolboy writing, ran as follows. Dear Julius. It's always better to have things in black and white. I don't feel I can be bothered to think of marriage until Tommy is found. Let's leave it till then. Yours affectionately. Tuppence. Tommy handed it back, his eyes shining. 
His feelings had undergone a sharp reaction. He now felt that Tuppence was all that was noble and disinterested. Had she not refused Julius without hesitation? True, the note betokened signs of weakening, but he could excuse that. It read almost like a bribe to Julius to spur him on in his efforts to find Tommy, but he supposed she had not really meant it that way. Darling Tuppence, there was not a girl in the world to touch her. When he saw her, his thoughts were brought up with a sudden jerk. As you say, he remarked, pulling himself together, there's not a hint here as to what she's up to. Hi, Henry. The small boy came obediently. Tommy produced five shillings. One thing more. Do you remember what the young lady did with the telegram? Henry gasped and spoke. She crumpled it up into a ball and threw it into the grate, and made a sort of noise like whoop. Sir. Very graphic, Henry, said Tommy. Here's your five shillings. Come on, Julius. We must find that telegram. They hurried upstairs. Tuppence had left the key in her door. The room was as she had left it. In the fireplace was a crumpled ball of orange and white. Tommy disentangled it and smoothed out the telegram. Come at once, Moat House, Ebury, Yorkshire, great developments, Tommy. They looked at each other in stupefaction. Julius spoke first. You didn't send it? Of course not. What does it mean? I guess it means the worst, said Julius quietly. They've got her. What? Sure thing. They signed your name, and she fell into the trap like a lamb. My God. What shall we do? Get busy, and go after her. Right now. There's no time to waste. It's almighty luck that she didn't take the wire with her. If she had we'd probably never have traced her. But we've got to hustle. Where's that Bradshaw? The energy of Julius was infectious. Left to himself, Tommy would probably have sat down to think things out for a good half hour before he decided on a plan of action. But with Julius Hersheimer about, hustling was inevitable. After a few muttered imprecations he handed the Bradshaw to Tommy as being more conversant with its mysteries. Tommy abandoned it in favor of an A. B. C. Here we are. Ebury, Yorks. From King's Cross. Or Street Pancras. Boy must have made a mistake. It was King's Cross, not Charing Cross. 12.50, that's the train she went by. 2.10, that's gone. 3.20 is the next, and a damned slow train too. What about the car? Tommy shook his head. Send it up if you like, but we'd better stick to the train. The great thing is to keep calm. Julius groaned. That's so. But it gets my goat to think of that innocent young girl in danger. Tommy nodded abstractedly. He was thinking. In a moment or two, he said. I say, Julius, what do they want her for, anyway? Eh? I don't get you? What I mean is that I don't think it's their game to do her any harm, explained Tommy, puckering his brow with the strain of his mental processes. She's a hostage, that's what she is. She's in no immediate danger, because if we tumble onto anything, she'd be damned useful to them. As long as they've got her, they've got the whip hand of us. See? Sure thing, said Julius thoughtfully. That's so. Besides, added Tommy, as an afterthought, I've great faith in tuppence. The journey was wearisome, with many stops, and crowded carriages. They had to change twice, once at Doncaster, once at a small junction. Ibury was a deserted station with a solitary porter, to whom Tommy addressed himself. Can you tell me the way to the moat house? The moat house? It's a tidy step from here. The big house near the sea, you mean? Tommy assented brazenly. After listening to the porter's meticulous but perplexing directions, they prepared to leave the station. It was beginning to rain, and they turned up the collars of their coats as they trudged through the slush of the road. Suddenly Tommy halted. Wait a moment. He ran back to the station and tackled the porter anew. Look here, do you remember a young lady who arrived by an earlier train, the 12.50 from London? She'd probably ask you the way to the moat house. He described tuppence as well as he could, but the porter shook his head. Several people had arrived by the train in question. He could not call to mind one young lady in particular. But he was quite certain that no one had asked him the way to the moat house. Tommy rejoined Julius, and explained. Depression was settling on him like a leaden weight. He felt convinced that their quest was going to be unsuccessful. 
The enemy had over three hours start. Three hours was more than enough for Mr. Brown. He would not ignore the possibility of the telegram having been found. The way seemed endless. Once they took the wrong turning and went nearly half a mile out of their direction. It was past seven o'clock when a small boy told them that T-Moat House was just past the next corner. A rusty iron gate swinging dismally on its hinges. An overgrown drive thick with leaves. There was something about the place that struck a chill to both their hearts. They went up the deserted drive. The leaves deadened their footsteps. The daylight was almost gone. It was like walking in a world of ghosts. Overhead the branches flapped and creaked with a mournful note. Occasionally a sodden leaf drifted silently down, startling them with its cold touch on their cheek. A turn of the drive brought them in sight of the house. That, too, seemed empty and deserted. The shutters were closed, the steps up to the door overgrown with moss. Was it indeed to this desolate spot that Tuppence had been decoyed? It seemed hard to believe that a human footstep had passed this way for months. Julius jerked the rusty bell handle. A jangling peal rang discordantly, echoing through the emptiness within. No one came. They rang again and again, but there was no sign of life. Then they walked completely round the house. Everywhere silence, and shuttered windows. If they could believe the evidence of their eyes the place was empty. Nothing doing, said Julius. They retraced their steps slowly to the gate. There must be a village handy, continued the young American. We'd better make inquiries there. They'll know something about the place, and whether there's been anyone there lately. Yes, that's not a bad idea. Proceeding up the road, they soon came to a little hamlet. On the outskirts of it, they met a workman swinging his bag of tools, and Tommy stopped him with a question. The moat house? It's empty. Been empty for years. Mrs. Sweeney's got the key if you want to go over it, next to the post office. Tommy thanked him. They soon found a post office, which was also a sweet and general fancy shop, and knocked at the door of the cottage next to it. A clean, wholesome-looking woman opened it. She readily produced the key of the moat house. Though I doubt if it's the kind of place to suit you, sir. In a terrible state of repair. Ceilings leaking and all. Twould need a lot of money spent on it. Thanks, said Tommy cheerily. I dare say it'll be a washout, but houses are scarce nowadays. That they are, declared the woman heartily. My daughter and son-in-law have been looking for a decent cottage for I don't know how long. It's all the war. Upset things terribly, it has. But excuse me, sir, it'll be too dark for you to see much of the house. Hadn't you better wait until tomorrow? That's all right. We'll have a look around this evening, anyway. We'd have been here before only we lost our way. What's the best place to stay at for the night round here? Mrs. Sweeney looked doubtful. There's the Yorkshire Arms, but it's not much of a place for gentlemen like you. Oh, it will do very well. Thanks. By the way, you've not had a young lady here asking for this key today? The woman shook her head. No one's been over the place for a long time. Thanks very much. They retraced their steps to the moat house. As the front door swung back on its hinges, protesting loudly, Julius struck a match and examined the floor carefully. Then he shook his head. I'd swear no one's passed this way. Look at the dust. Thick. Not a sign of a footmark. They wandered round the deserted house. Everywhere the same tale. Thick layers of dust apparently undisturbed. This gets me, said Julius. I don't believe Tuppence was ever in this house. She must have been. Julius shook his head without replying. We'll go over it again tomorrow, said Tommy. Perhaps we'll see more in the daylight. On the morrow they took up the search once more, and were reluctantly forced to the conclusion that the house had not been invaded for some considerable time. They might have left the village altogether but for a fortunate discovery of Tommy's. As they were retracing their steps to the gate, he gave a sudden cry, and stooping, picked something up from among the leaves, and held it out to Julius. It was a small gold brooch. That's Tuppence's. Are you sure? Absolutely. I've often seen her wear it. Julius drew a deep breath. I guess that settles it. She came as far as here, anyway. We'll make that pub our headquarters, and raise hell round here until we find her. Somebody must have seen her. Forthwith the campaign began. Tommy and Julius worked separately and together, but the result was the same. 
Nobody answering to Tuppence's description had been seen in the vicinity. They were baffled, but not discouraged. Finally they altered their tactics. Tuppence had certainly not remained long in the neighborhood of the moat house. That pointed to her having been overcome and carried away in a car. They renewed inquiries. Had anyone seen a car standing somewhere near the moat house that day? Again they met with no success. Julius wired to town for his own car, and they scoured the neighborhood daily with unflagging zeal. A gray limousine on which they had set high hopes was traced to Harrogate, and turned out to be the property of a highly respectable maiden lady. Each day saw them set out on a new quest. Julius was like a hound on the leash. He followed up the slenderest clue. Every car that had passed through the village on the fateful day was tracked down. He forced his way into country properties and submitted the owners of the motors to a searching cross-examination. His apologies were as thorough as his methods, and seldom failed in disarming the indignation of his victims, but, as day succeeded day, they were no nearer to discovering Tuppence's whereabouts. So well had the abduction been planned that the girl seemed literally to have vanished into thin air. And another preoccupation was weighing on Tommy's mind. Do you know how long we've been here? He asked one morning as they sat facing each other at breakfast. A week. We're no nearer to finding tuppence, and next Sunday is the 29th. Shucks, said Julius thoughtfully. I'd almost forgotten about the 29th. I've been thinking of nothing but tuppence. So have I. At least, I hadn't forgotten about the 29th, but it didn't seem to matter a damn in comparison to finding tuppence. But today's the 23rd, and time's getting short. If we're ever going to get hold of her at all, we must do it before the 29th, her life won't be worth an hour's purchase afterwards. The hostage game will be played out by then. I'm beginning to feel that we've made a big mistake in the way we've set about this. We've wasted time and we're no forager. I'm with you there. We've been a couple of mutts, who've bitten off a bigger bit than they can chew. I'm going to quit fooling right away. What do you mean? I'll tell you. I'm going to do what we ought to have done a week ago. I'm going right back to London to put the case in the hands of your British police. We fancied ourselves as sleuths. Sleuths. It was a piece of damn fool foolishness. I'm through. I've had enough of it. Scotland Yard for me. You're right, said Tommy slowly. I wish to God we'd gone there right away. Better late than never. We've been like a couple of babes playing here we go round the mulberry bush. Now I am going right along to Scotland Yard to ask them to take me by the hand and show me the way I should go. I guess the professional always scores over the amateur in the end. Are you coming along with me? Tommy shook his head. What's the good? One of us is enough. I might as well stay here and nose round a bit longer. Something might turn up. One never knows. Sure thing. Well, so long. I'll be back in a couple of shakes with a few inspectors along. I shall tell them to pick out their brightest and best. But the course of events was not to follow the plan Julius had laid down. Later in the day Tommy received a wire. Join me Manchester Midland Hotel. Important news, Julius. At 7.30 that night Tommy alighted from a slow cross-country train. Julius was on the platform. Thought you'd come by this train if you weren't out when my wire arrived. Tommy grasped him by the arm. What is it? Is Tuppence found? Julius shook his head. No. But I found this waiting in London. Just arrived. He handed the telegraph form to the other. Tommy's eyes opened as he read. Jane Finn found. Come Manchester Midland Hotel immediately, P. Legerton. Julius took the form back and folded it up. Queer, he said thoughtfully. I thought that lawyer chap had quit. Chapter 19 Jane Finn my train got in half an hour ago, explained Julius, as he led the way out of the station. I reckoned you'd come by this before I left London, and wired accordingly to Sir James. He's booked rooms for us, and will be round to dine at eight. What made you think he'd cease to take any interest in the case? Asked Tommy curiously. What he said, replied Julius dryly. The old bird's as close as an oyster. Like all the darned lot of them. He wasn't going to commit himself till he was sure he could deliver the goods. I wonder, said Tommy thoughtfully. Julius turned on him. You wonder what? Whether that was his real reason. Sure. You bet your life it was. Tommy shook his head unconvinced. Sir James arrived punctually at eight o'clock, and Julius introduced Tommy. 
Sir James shook hands with him warmly. I am delighted to make your acquaintance, Mr. Beresford. I have heard so much about you from Miss Tuppence he smiled involuntarily, that it really seems as though I already know you quite well. Thank you, sir, said Tommy with his cheerful grin. He scanned the great lawyer eagerly. Like Tuppence, he felt the magnetism of the other's personality. He was reminded of Mr. Carter. The two men, totally unlike so far as physical resemblance went, produced a similar effect. Beneath the weary manner of the one and the professional reserve of the other, lay the same quality of mind, keen-edged like a rapier. In the meantime he was conscious of Sir James's close scrutiny. When the lawyer dropped his eyes the young man had the feeling that the other had read him through and through like an open book. He could not but wonder what the final judgment was, but there was little chance of learning that. Sir James took in everything, but gave out only what he chose. A proof of that occurred almost at once. Immediately the first greetings were over Julius broke out into a flood of eager questions. How had Sir James managed to track the girl? Why had he not let them know that he was still working on the case? And so on. Sir James stroked his chin and smiled. At last he said. Just so, just so. Well, she's found. And that's the great thing, isn't it? Eh? Come now, that's the great thing? Sure it is. But just how did you strike her trail? Miss Tuppence and I thought you'd quit for good and all. Ah, the lawyer shot a lightning glance at him, then resumed operations on his chin. You thought that, did you? Did you really? H.M., dear me. But I guess I can take it we were wrong, pursued Julius. Well, I don't know that I should go so far as to say that. But it's certainly fortunate for all parties that we've managed to find the young lady. But where is she? demanded Julius, his thoughts flying off on another tack. I thought you'd be sure to bring her along? That would hardly be possible, said Sir James gravely. Why? Because the young lady was knocked down in a street accident, and has sustained slight injuries to the head. She was taken to the infirmary, and on recovering consciousness gave her name as Jane Finn. When, ah, I heard that, I arranged for her to be removed to the house of a doctor, a friend of mine, and wired at once for you. She relapsed into unconsciousness and has not spoken since. She's not seriously hurt? Oh, a bruise and a cut or two, really, from a medical point of view, absurdly slight injuries to have produced such a condition. Her state is probably to be attributed to the mental shock consequent on recovering her memory. It's come back? cried Julius excitedly. Sir James tapped the table rather impatiently. Undoubtedly, Mr. Hersheimer, since she was able to give her real name. I thought you had appreciated that point. And you just happened to be on the spot, said Tommy. Seems quite like a fairy tale. But Sir James was far too wary to be drawn. Coincidences are curious things, he said dryly. Nevertheless Tommy was now certain of what he had before only suspected. Sir James's presence in Manchester was not accidental. Far from abandoning the case, as Julius supposed, he had by some means of his own successfully run the missing girl to earth. The only thing that puzzled Tommy was the reason for all this secrecy. He concluded that it was a foible of the legal mind. Julius was speaking. After dinner, he announced, I shall go right away and see Jane. That will be impossible, I fear, said Sir James. It is very unlikely they would allow her to see visitors at this time of night. I should suggest tomorrow morning about ten o'clock. Julius flushed. There was something in Sir James which always stirred him to antagonism. It was a conflict of two masterful personalities. All the same, I reckon I'll go round there tonight and see if I can't ginger them up to break through their silly rules. It will be quite useless, Mr. Hersheimer. The words came out like the crack of a pistol, and Tommy looked up with a start. Julius was nervous and excited. The hand with which he raised his glass to his lips shook slightly, but his eyes held Sir James's defiantly. For a moment the hostility between the two seemed likely to burst into flame, but in the end Julius lowered his eyes, defeated. For the moment, I reckon you're the boss. Thank you, said the other. We will say ten o'clock then? With consummate ease of manner he turned to Tommy. I must confess, Mr. Beresford, that it was something of a surprise to me to see you here this evening. The last I heard of you was that your friends were in grave anxiety on your behalf. Nothing had been heard of you for some days, 
and Miss Tuppence was inclined to think you had got into difficulties. I had, sir. Tommy grinned reminiscently. I was never in a tighter place in my life. Helped out by questions from Sir James, he gave an abbreviated account of his adventures. The lawyer looked at him with renewed interest as he brought the tale to a close. You got yourself out of a tight place very well, he said gravely. I congratulate you. You displayed a great deal of ingenuity and carried your part through well. Tommy blushed, his face assuming a prawn-like hue at the praise. I couldn't have got away but for the girl, sir. No. Sir James smiled a little. It was lucky for you she happened to, er, uh, take a fancy to you. Tommy appeared about to protest, but Sir James went on. There's no doubt about her being one of the gang, I suppose? I'm afraid not, sir. I thought perhaps they were keeping her there by force, but the way she acted didn't fit in with that. You see, she went back to them when she could have got away. Sir James nodded thoughtfully. What did she say? Something about wanting to be taken to Marguerite? Yes, sir. I suppose she meant Mrs. Vondermeyer. She always signed herself Rita Vondermeyer. All her friends spoke of her as Rita. Still, I suppose the girl must have been in the habit of calling her by her full name. And, at the moment she was crying out to her, Mrs. Vondermeyer was either dead or dying. Curious. There are one or two points that strike me as being obscure. Their sudden change of attitude towards yourself, for instance. By the way, the house was raided, of course? Yes, sir, but they'd all cleared out. Naturally, said Sir James dryly. And not a clue left behind. I wonder, the lawyer tapped the table thoughtfully. Something in his voice made Tommy look up. Would this man's eyes have seen something where theirs had been blind? He spoke impulsively. I wish you'd been there, sir, to go over the house. I wish I had, said Sir James quietly. He sat for a moment in silence. Then he looked up. And since then? What have you been doing? For a moment, Tommy stared at him. Then it dawned on him that of course the lawyer did not know. I forgot that you didn't know about Tuppence, he said slowly. The sickening anxiety, forgotten for a while in the excitement of knowing Jane Finn was found at last, swept over him again. The lawyer laid down his knife and fork sharply. Has anything happened to Miss Tuppence? His voice was keen-edged. She's disappeared, said Julius. When? A week ago. How? Sir James's questions fairly shot out. Between them Tommy and Julius gave the history of the last week and their futile search. Sir James went at once to the root of the matter. A wire signed with your name? They knew enough of you both for that. They weren't sure of how much you had learnt in that house. Their kidnapping of Miss Tuppence is the countermove to your escape. If necessary they could seal your lips with a threat of what might happen to her. Tommy nodded. That's just what I thought. Sir. Sir James looked at him keenly. You had worked that out, had you? Not bad, not at all bad. The curious thing is that they certainly did not know anything about you when they first held you prisoner. You are sure that you did not in any way disclose your identity? Tommy shook his head. That's so, said Julius with a nod. Therefore I reckon someone put them wise, and not earlier than Sunday afternoon. Yes, but who? That almighty omniscient Mr. Brown, of course. There was a faint note of derision in the American's voice which made Sir James look up sharply. You don't believe in Mr. Brown, Mr. Hersheimer? No, sir, I do not, returned the young American with emphasis. Not as such, that is to say. I reckon it out that he's a figurehead, just a bogey name to frighten the children with. The real head of this business is that Russian chap Kramanen. I guess he's quite capable of running revolutions in three countries at once if he chose. The man Whittington is probably the head of the English branch. I disagree with you, said Sir James shortly. Mr. Brown exists. He turned to Tommy. Did you happen to notice where that wire was handed in? No, sir, I'm afraid I didn't. H.M. Got it with you? It's upstairs, sir, in my kit. I'd like to have a look at it sometime. No hurry. You've wasted a week Tommy hung his head, a day or so more is immaterial. We'll deal with Miss Jane Finn first. Afterwards, we'll set to work to rescue Miss Tuppence from bondage. I don't think she's in any immediate danger. That is, so long as they don't know that we've got Jane Finn, and that her memory has returned. 
We must keep that dark at all costs. You understand? The other two assented, and, after making arrangements for meeting on the morrow, the great lawyer took his leave. At ten o'clock, the two young men were at the appointed spot. Sir James had joined them on the doorstep. He alone appeared unexcited. He introduced them to the doctor. Mr. Hersheimer, Mr. Beresford, Dr. Roylance. How is the patient? Going on well. Evidently no idea of the flight of time. Asked this morning how many had been saved from the Lusitania. Was it in the papers yet? That, of course, was only what was to be expected. She seems to have something on her mind, though. I think we can relieve her anxiety. May we go up? Certainly. Tommy's heart beat sensibly faster as they followed the doctor upstairs. Jane Finn at last. The long sought, the mysterious, the elusive Jane Finn. How wildly improbable success had seemed. And here in this house, her memory almost miraculously restored, lay the girl who held the future of England in her hands. A half groan broke from Tommy's lips. If only Tuppence could have been at his side to share in the triumphant conclusion of their joint venture. Then he put the thought of Tuppence resolutely aside. His confidence in Sir James was growing. There was a man who would unerringly ferret out Tuppence's whereabouts. In the meantime Jane Finn. And suddenly a dread clutched at his heart. It seemed too easy. Suppose they should find her dead, stricken down by the hand of Mr. Brown? In another minute he was laughing at these melodramatic fancies. The doctor held open the door of a room and they passed in. On the white bed, bandages round her head, lay the girl. Somehow the whole scene seemed unreal. It was so exactly what one expected that it gave the effect of being beautifully staged. The girl looked from one to the other of them with large wondering eyes. Sir James spoke first. Miss Finn, he said, this is your cousin, Mr. Julius P. Hersheimer. A faint flush flitted over the girl's face, as Julius stepped forward and took her hand. How do, Cousin Jane? He said lightly. But Tommy caught the tremor in his voice. Are you really Uncle Hiram's son? She asked wonderingly. Her voice, with the slight warmth of the Western accent, had an almost thrilling quality. It seemed vaguely familiar to Tommy, but he thrust the impression aside as impossible. Sure thing. We used to read about Uncle Hiram in the papers, continued the girl, in her low soft tones. But I never thought I'd meet you one day. Mother figured it out that Uncle Hiram would never get over being mad with her. The old man was like that, admitted Julius. But I guess the new generation's sort of different. Got no use for the family feud business. First thing I thought about, soon as the war was over, was to come along and hunt you up. A shadow passed over the girl's face. They've been telling me things, dreadful things, that my memory went, and that there are years I shall never know about, years lost out of my life. You didn't realize that yourself. The girl's eyes opened wide. Why, no. It seems to me as though it were no time since we were being hustled into those boats. I can see it all now. She closed her eyes with a shudder. Julius looked across at Sir James, who nodded. Don't worry any. It isn't worth it. Now. See here, Jane, there's something we want to know about. There was a man aboard that boat with some mighty important papers on him, and the big guns in this country have got a notion that he passed on the goods to you. Is that so? The girl hesitated, her glance shifting to the other two. Julius understood. Mr. Beresford is commissioned by the British government to get those papers back. Sir James P. Legerton is an English member of Parliament, and might be a big gun in the cabinet if he liked. It's owing to him that we've ferreted you out at last. So you can go right ahead and tell us the whole story. Did Danvers give you the papers? Yes. He said they'd have a better chance with me, because they would save the women and children first. Just as we thought, said Sir James. He said they were very important, that they might make all the difference to the Allies. But, if it's all so long ago, and the war's over, what does it matter now? I guess history repeats itself. Jane. First there was a great hue and cry over those papers, then it all died down, and now the whole caboodle started all over again, for rather different reasons. Then you can hand them over to us right away? But I can't. What? I haven't got them. You, haven't, got them? Julius punctuated the words with little pauses. No, I hid them. You hid them? Yes. 
I got uneasy. People seemed to be watching me. It scared me, badly. She put her hand to her head. It's almost the last thing I remember before waking up in the hospital. Go on, said Sir James, in his quiet penetrating tones. What do you remember? She turned to him obediently. It was at Hollyhead. I came that way, I don't remember why. That doesn't matter. Go on. In the confusion on the key I slipped away. Nobody saw me. I took a car. Told the man to drive me out of the town. I watched when we got on the open road. No other car was following us. I saw a path at the side of the road. I told the man to wait. She paused, then went on. The path led to the cliff, and down to the sea between big yellow gorse bushes, they were like golden flames. I looked round. There wasn't a soul in sight. But just level with my head there was a hole in the rock. It was quite small, I could only just get my hand in, but it went a long way back. I took the oilskin packet from round my neck and shoved it right in as far as I could. Then I tore off a bit of gorse, my. But it did prick, and plugged the hole with it so that you'd never guess there was a crevice of any kind there. Then I marked the place carefully in my own mind, so that I'd find it again. There was a queer boulder in the path just there, for all the world like a dog sitting up begging. Then I went back to the road. The car was waiting, and I drove back. I just caught the train. I was a bit ashamed of myself for fancying things maybe, but, by and by, I saw the man opposite me wink at a woman who was sitting next to me, and I felt scared again, and was glad the papers were safe. I went out in the corridor to get a little air. I thought I'd slip into another carriage. But the woman called me back, said I'd dropped something, and when I stooped to look, something seemed to hit me, here. She placed her hand to the back of her head. I don't remember anything more until I woke up in the hospital. There was a pause. Thank you, Miss Finn. It was Sir James who spoke. I hope we have not tired you. Oh, that's all right. My head aches a little, but otherwise I feel fine. Julia stepped forward and took her hand again. So long, Cousin Jane. I'm going to get busy after those papers, but I'll be back in two shakes of a dog's tail and I'll touch you up to London and give you the time of your young life before we go back to the States. I mean it, so hurry up and get well. Chapter 20 Too late. In the street they held an informal council of war. Sir James had drawn a watch from his pocket. The boat train to Holyhead stops at Chester at 12.14. If you start at once I think you can catch the connection. Tommy looked up, puzzled. Is there any need to hurry, sir? Today is only the 24th. I guess it's always well to get up early in the morning, said Julius, before the lawyer had time to reply. We'll make tracks for the depot right away. A little frown had settled on Sir James's brow. I wish I could come with you. I am due to speak at a meeting at two o'clock. It is unfortunate. The reluctance in his tone was very evident. It was clear, on the other hand, that Julius was easily disposed to put up with the loss of the other's company. I guess there's nothing complicated about this deal, he remarked. Just a game of hide and seek, that's all. I hope so, said Sir James. Sure thing. What else could it be? You are still young, Mr. Hersheimer. At my age you will probably have learnt one lesson. Never underestimate your adversary. The gravity of his tone impressed Tommy, but had little effect upon Julius. You think Mr. Brown might come along and take a hand? If he does, I'm ready for him. He slapped his pocket. I carry a gun. Little Willie here travels round with me everywhere. He produced a murderous-looking automatic, and tapped it affectionately before returning it to its home. But he won't be needed this trip. There's nobody to put Mr. Brown wise. The lawyer shrugged his shoulders. There was nobody to put Mr. Brown wise to the fact that Mrs. Von der Meyer meant to betray him. Nevertheless, Mrs. von der Meyer died without speaking. Julius was silenced for once, and Sir James added on a lighter note. I only want to put you on your guard. Goodbye, and good luck. Take no unnecessary risks once the papers are in your hands. If there is any reason to believe that you have been shadowed, destroy them at once. Good luck to you. The game is in your hands now. He shook hands with them both. Ten minutes later the two young men were seated in a first-class carriage en route for Chester. For a long time neither of them spoke. When at length Julius broke the silence, it was with a totally unexpected remark. Say, 
he observed thoughtfully, did you ever make a darned fool of yourself over a girl's face? Tommy, after a moment's astonishment, searched his mind. Can't say I have, he replied at last. Not that I can recollect, anyhow. Why? Because for the last two months I've been making a sentimental idiot of myself over Jane. First moment I clapped eyes on her photograph my heart did all the usual stunts you read about in novels. I guess I'm ashamed to admit it, but I came over here determined to find her and fix it all up, and take her back as Mrs. Julius P. Hersheimer. Oh, said Tommy, amazed. Julius uncrossed his legs brusquely and continued. Just shows what an almighty fool a man can make of himself. One look at the girl in the flesh, and I was cured. Feeling more tongue-tied than ever, Tommy ejaculated oh. Again. No disparagement to Jane, mind you, continued the other. She's a real nice girl, and some fellow will fall in love with her right away. I thought her a very good-looking girl, said Tommy, finding his tongue. Sure she is. But she's not like her photo one bit. At least I suppose she is in a way, must be, because I recognized her right off. If I'd seen her in a crowd I'd have said there's a girl whose face I know right away without any hesitation. But there was something about that photo Julius shook his head, and heaved a sigh, I guess romance is a mighty queer thing. It must be, said Tommy coldly, if you can come over here in love with one girl, and propose to another within a fortnight. Julius had the grace to look discomposed. Well, you see, I'd got a sort of tired feeling that I'd never find Jane, and that it was all plum foolishness anyway. And then, oh, well, the French, for instance, are much more sensible in the way they look at things. They keep romance and marriage apart. Tommy flushed. Well, I'm damned. If that's... Julius hastened to interrupt. Say now, don't be hasty. I don't mean what you mean. I take it Americans have a higher opinion of morality than you have even. What I meant was that the French set about marriage in a business-like way, find two people who are suited to one another, look after the money affairs, and see the whole thing practically, and in a business-like spirit. If you ask me, said Tommy, we're all too damn business-like nowadays. We're always saying, will it pay? The men are bad enough, and the girls are worse. Cool down, son. Don't get so heated. I feel heated, said Tommy. Julius looked at him and judged it wise to say no more. However, Tommy had plenty of time to cool down before they reached Hollyhead, and the cheerful grin had returned to his countenance as they alighted at their destination. After consultation, and with the aid of a road map, they were fairly well agreed as to direction, so were able to hire a taxi without more ado and drive out on the road leading to Treader Bay. They instructed the men to go slowly, and watched narrowly so as not to miss the path. They came to it not long after leaving the town, and Tommy stopped the car promptly, asked in a casual tone whether the path led down to the sea, and hearing it did paid off the man in handsome style. A moment later the taxi was slowly chugging back to Hollyhead. Tommy and Julius watched it out of sight, and then turned to the narrow path. It's the right one, I suppose? asked Tommy doubtfully. There must be simply heaps along here. Sure it is. Look at the gorse. Remember what Jane said? Tommy looked at the swelling hedges of golden blossom which bordered the path on either side, and was convinced. They went down in single file, Julius leading. Twice Tommy turned his head uneasily. Julius looked back. What is it? I don't know. I've got the wind up somehow. Keep fancying there's someone following us. Can't be, said Julius positively. We'd see him. Tommy had to admit that this was true. Nevertheless, his sense of uneasiness deepened. In spite of himself he believed in the omniscience of the enemy. I rather wish that fellow would come along, said Julius. He patted his pocket. Little William here is just taking for exercise. Do you always carry it, him, with you? inquired Tommy with burning curiosity. Most always. I guess you never know what might turn up. Tommy kept a respectful silence. He was impressed by little William. It seemed to remove the menace of Mr. Brown farther away. The path was now running along the side of the cliff, parallel to the sea. Suddenly Julius came to such an abrupt halt that Tommy cannoned into him. What's up? He inquired. Look there. If that doesn't beat the band. Tommy looked. 
Standing out half obstructing the path was a huge boulder which certainly bore a fanciful resemblance to a begging terrier. Well, said Tommy, refusing to share Julius's emotion, it's what we expected to see, isn't it? Julius looked at him sadly and shook his head. British phlegm. Sure we expected it, but it kind of rattles me, all the same, to see it sitting there just where we expected to find it. Tommy, whose calm was, perhaps, more assumed than natural, moved his feet impatiently. Push on. What about the hole? They scanned the cliffside narrowly. Tommy heard himself saying idiotically. The gorse won't be there after all these years. And Julius replied solemnly. I guess you're right. Tommy suddenly pointed with a shaking hand. What about that crevice there? Julius replied in an awe-stricken voice. That's it, for sure. They looked at each other. When I was in France, said Tommy reminiscently, whenever my Batman failed to call me, he always said that he had come over queer. I never believed it. But whether he felt it or not, there is such a sensation. I've got it now. Badly. He looked at the rock with a kind of agonized passion. Damn it. He cried. It's impossible. Five years. Think of it. Birds nesting boys, picnic parties, thousands of people passing. It can't be there. It's a hundred to one against its being there. It's against all reason. Indeed, he felt it to be impossible, more, perhaps, because he could not believe in his own success where so many others had failed. The thing was too easy, therefore it could not be. The hole would be empty. Julius looked at him with a widening smile. I guess you're rattled now all right, he drawled with some enjoyment. Well, here goes. He thrust his hand into the crevice, and made a slight grimace. It's a tight fit. Jane's hand must be a few sizes smaller than mine. I don't feel anything, no, say, what's this? Gee whiz. And with a flourish he waved aloft a small discolored packet. It's the goods all right. Sewn up in oilskin. Hold it while I get my penknife. The unbelievable had happened. Tommy held the precious packet tenderly between his hands. They had succeeded. It's queer, he murmured idly, you'd think the stitches would have rotted. They look just as good as new. They cut them carefully and ripped away the oilskin. Inside was a small folded sheet of paper. With trembling fingers they unfolded it. The sheet was blank. They stared at each other, puzzled. A dummy? Hazarded Julius. Was Danvers just a decoy? Tommy shook his head. That solution did not satisfy him. Suddenly his face cleared. I've got it. Sympathetic ink. You think so? Worth trying anyhow. Heat usually does the trick. Get some sticks. We'll make a fire. In a few minutes the little fire of twigs and leaves was blazing merrily. Tommy held the sheet of paper near the glow. The paper curled a little with the heat. Nothing more. Suddenly Julius grasped his arm, and pointed to where characters were appearing in a faint brown color. Gee whiz. You've got it. Say, that idea of yours was great. It never occurred to me. Tommy held the paper in position some minutes longer until he judged the heat had done its work. Then he withdrew it. A moment later he uttered a cry. Across the sheet a neat brown printing ran the words, with the compliments of Mr. Brown. Chapter 21 Tommy Makes a Discovery For a moment or two they stood staring at each other stupidly, dazed with the shock. Somehow, inexplicably, Mr. Brown had forestalled them. Tommy accepted defeat quietly. Not so Julius. How in tarnation did he get ahead of us? That's what beats me. He ended up. Tommy shook his head, and said dully. It accounts for the stitches being new. We might have guessed. Never mind the darned stitches. How did he get ahead of us? We hustled all we knew. It's downright impossible for anyone to get here quicker than we did. And, anyway, how did he know? Do you reckon there was a dictaphone in Jane's room? I guess there must have been. But Tommy's common sense pointed out objections. No one could have known beforehand that she was going to be in that house, much less that particular room. That's so, admitted Julius. Then one of the nurses was a crook and listened at the door. How's that? I don't see that it matters anyway, said Tommy wearily. He may have found out some months ago, and removed the papers, then, no, by Jove, that won't wash. They'd have been published at once. Sure thing they would. 
No, someone's got ahead of us today by an hour or so. But how they did it gets my goat. I wish that Chappie Legerton had been with us, said Tommy thoughtfully. Why? Julius stared. The mischief was done when we came. Yes, Tommy hesitated. He could not explain his own feeling, the illogical idea that the K.C.'s presence would somehow have averted the catastrophe. He reverted to his former point of view. It's no good arguing about how it was done. The game's up. We've failed. There's only one thing for me to do. What's that? Get back to London as soon as possible. Mr. Carter must be warned. It's only a matter of hours now before the blow falls. But, at any rate, he ought to know the worst. The duty was an unpleasant one, but Tommy had no intention of shirking it. He must report his failure to Mr. Carter. After that his work was done. He took the midnight mail to London. Julius elected to stay the night at Holyhead. Half an hour after arrival, haggard and pale, Tommy stood before his chief. I've come to report, sir. I failed, failed badly. Mr. Carter eyed him sharply. You mean that the treaty is in the hands of Mr. Brown, sir? Ask, said Mr. Carter quietly. The expression on his face did not change, but Tommy caught the flicker of despair in his eyes. It convinced him as nothing else had done that the outlook was hopeless. Thank you for listening to today's episode I really hoped you enjoyed it. There will be more to come, please subscribe not to miss out on what is next. I will be looking forward to your return. The music is by Madfan from Pixabay. To support this and other artists go to pixabay.com. Sheila.